gonna buy you a mockingbird And if that mockingbird won't sing Mama's gonna buy you a diamond ring Hey everyone, I'm Amanda And I'm Lindsay And welcome to Blood and Black Lace Where we discuss what nightmares are truly made of Tonight, in episode four, we are discussing Penhurst Asylum in Spring City, Pennsylvania, which is about an hour outside of Philadelphia. Originally known as the Eastern Pennsylvania State Institution for the Feeble-Minded and Epileptic, unless, of course, you are part of the institution, and then it is known as Hell on Earth. Construction began in 1903 when it was conceived as a state-funded and operated facility to house any person who was deemed unable to function in normal society. But what is normal anyways? In November of 1908, Penhurst admitted the first patient. These patients included physically and mentally disabled people, individuals who were physically or psychologically abnormal, such as mute, deaf, and blind. If you were different, this is where you went to live. Upon entry into the asylum, Patients were sorted into categories based on imbecile or insane, epileptic or healthy, and dental categories of good, poor, or treated. These qualifications would dictate their lodgings and care. As time went on, the Institute housed immigrants, criminals, and even orphans. Thousands of children were abandoned here by their own parents. This place became the solution for ridding society of all of its undesirables. In fact, the campus itself functioned as a self-contained city, with the residents inside completing the tasks that were needed to run their small, isolated society. This campus had its own power plant, farm, hospital, morgue, barbershop, and even a firehouse. In 1913, the government created a commission for the care of the feeble-minded. This declared that disabled people were both unfit for citizenship and a menace to society, thus causing these people to be taken into custody. This kept disabled people away from the general population for everyone's safety, and it made sure that they didn't reproduce. Now, some of the torture that was afflicted onto the patients was cruel beyond imagination. The staff would sometimes tie their patients to their beds and leave them alone for hours, if not days. This meant many of the patients would be covered in their own feces by the time anyone came back to check on them. But this isn't even the worst of it. Those patients who couldn't care for themselves became the most vulnerable victims. Patients who showed aggression were often drugged, which doesn't seem too bad considering. Sometimes the staff would remove all of the teeth of a patient who bit another patient or a staff member. This happened so often that even years after the asylum closed, visitors would find teeth in the tunnels. In fact, the dentist chair where thousands of teeth were removed still sits in the tunnels beneath Penhurst Complex. By the 1960s, Penhurst was home to about 2,791 people, way over 1,000 more than maximum capacity, which was only 500 patients. In 1968, a young reporter did a TV special on Penhurst called Suffer Little Children, thrusting this asylum into the public's eye for the first time. Images that were captured by the reporter showed individuals chained to adult-sized cribs, children in cages. The public was appalled. Allegations of abuse surfaced throughout the years after the TV show. And finally, in 1987, the facility closed its doors. The closure came about after a large legal dispute filed by a former resident who cited intense physical, emotional, and psychological abuse by the hands of those who were there to care for the patients, the nurses, and doctors. However, those who were in power were not only dishing out the abuse, but also arranging patients to assault and bully one another. Today, the asylum is shrouded with ghost stories and reports of paranormal activity. Caretakers of the property believe that the buildings and underground tunnels are haunted 
by the angry spirits of patients who suffered and died there. There are reports of slamming doors, footsteps, and sounds of vomiting coming from otherwise empty rooms. Some witnesses have even seen the spirit of a little girl roaming the buildings, perhaps waiting to tell her own story of sorrow and neglect. Visitors have claimed to hear voices, shrieks, and murmurs of pain from the former residents and inmates who never got the chance to leave this horrid facility. Investigators have experienced poltergeist-like and demonic activity. Spirits touched and shoved the ghost hunters, and they threw objects at the research team. An entity even scratched an investigator during one of the more active evenings, which indicates demonic activity. In 2010, one building of the asylum was reopened and turned into the Penners Asylum Haunted House. It is known as being the scariest haunted house in Pennsylvania. And if you want a truly terrifying experience, join Ghost Hunters USA exclusive for an overnight in the former asylum. The overnight ghost hunt runs from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. the following morning. This experience gives you access to the infamous Mayflower Building and the campus's tunnels. Plus, you'll have the chance to participate in seances, ghost hunting vigils, ghost hunting with professional paranormal hunters, and you're even given time to explore on your own. Truly not an experience for the faint of heart. Are they sponsoring us? Well, no. Then why the fuck are we giving them free advertisement? Shut the fuck up and get back to the goddamn fucking rifting. Okay, so when we were researching this episode, I came across this article about this blogger who met up with a personal ghost hunter who has uh, actually spent a considerable amount of time within the walls of Penhurst. He actually, you know, told this blogger some stories, but one of the stories that she wrote about was the story of Dr. Fear. And I'm not making the name up, Dr. Fear. Apparently he was a staff member from the 1960s who like to inject patients with painful serums for no reason other than to teach them a lesson. I mean, dude sounds pretty sick. Absolutely. There was actually a story recently. Someone, a nurse, was injecting dialysis patients with bleach. I heard about that. Yeah, it still happens today. So the blogger I was talking about earlier, um, she also met with a former employee from the Penhurst Asylum um, and she actually never outright denied the mistreatment that occurred there over the years, but she wanted to set the record straight and give a more accurate, accurate description of how the Institute was run in its later years. Um, she did explain for the, for much of the time that Penhurst was operational, society was considered to be more prim and proper. So having a child with a physical deformity or mental disability wasn't socially acceptable and it was definitely not as understood as it is now. So with that, children were, were driven up to the entrance of the Penhurst grounds and simply dropped off. So it wasn't, it was much less a horror movie and much more a product of our callous society, unfortunately. Absolutely. Patients wanted attention so bad they were tied to their beds they were locked in their rooms 24 7 they all they wanted was personal attention they wanted affection they wanted someone to be nice to them to talk to them to interact with them whether they were crazy or not it didn't matter they were still people so what the patients would do they would put their own feces all over them in order just to get a bath. Can you believe that? Yes, society didn't understand, but it was more of a disease that they didn't understand. It was less of a, you know, deformity or, or mental illness. I think it was, it was more of like a medical illness that they didn't understand. But I definitely believe that the Salem witch trials, you know, kind of were in the same way. You know, the 
society was prim and proper. They didn't understand certain things. So these innocent people got hung. What do you think is the difference between the history and fan fiction desire to be scared? So like going to haunted houses, uh, watching horror flicks, whether it's being people killed or jump out and scare you versus going to a truly haunted, you know, supernatural experience, like a ghost tour or something like that. The, the whole thing of wanting that, I guess, what's the difference between the history of a place being haunted, I guess, or the fan fiction about it? I think everybody uh, deep down inside has a desire, a want to be scared. Um, I mean, it's, it's one of our most basic instincts is, you know, fight or flight, uh, you know, so it's, it's ingrained in us, you know, to be scared. You know, we either stand our ground and fight or we run away. And I don't know about you, but in haunted houses, I run like a bitch. Um, I think that when you get a haunted house like Penhurst Asylum, and it's a haunted house that is designed by, you know, a person inside a, a real haunted house where tr- terrible things happen, I, I think that it, the level of creepiness kind of far exceeds these haunted hayrides that we have out there. Um, you know, anybody can jump out at you. Anybody can wear a scary mask. Anybody can put on makeup. But I think that the the scariness behind the story of Penhurst Asylum and all the horrible things that went on there and stuff like that, I think that just makes it even more terrifying. It's almost a drug for me, uh, quote unquote, adrenaline rush. Um, it's not like riding a roller coaster. For me to go into a truly, say, 1800 uh, cemetery, knowing that there's history of those people, they fought in wars, they suffered true poorness, they suffered agriculturally trying to get food for their family and trying to do things the cheap way, but live with pride and to me that is interesting the stories behind these people i've gotten into ancestry.com and i've tracked my family back to the 1400s coming from england it's crazy because now i'm addicted i want to do more research and i think it goes with the same thing with paranormal people start to get I guess, obsessed with whether watching it on the travel channel or uh, looking things up on Google, YouTube, watching uh, these paranormal investigators. Are they truly picking up EVPs? Are they, I, I get all the time on Facebook, orbs, pictures of orbs. People will send me, what do you think this is? Do you think this is an orb or just a reflection? There's uh, legs of a child in the background. Do you think that's true? Well, possibly it could be a number of things. Then you kind of go into conspiracy theories. Well, we are we crossing universes? You know, is that child accidentally in our universe and their universe at the same time? What's going on there? Or is that just your imagination? And now that you've said that, now it's in my head that there's a child in that picture. So I sort of think that's sort of the difference between going to a haunted house and getting scared or somebody playing a trick on you. There's a level of adrenaline, I think. And for some people, they can't handle that. Like you and I, we can go into these places and they can say it's haunted all they want. But for you and I, we need to see it. We need to hear it. We need to know the history behind it so that we can put two and two together. We're not investigators by any means, but we are extremely interested. So they like the, uh, the orgasms. Oh my God. Yes. (laughs) He said, uh, I wonder how many times, uh, 
that device was Googled after that podcast. <laughs> right? I said, my God, it looks like a fucking hand sander. I told you. I told you that device looked brutal. Oh, Lord. It reminds me of on a sunny in Philadelphia with the bike. What do you do when you get tired? Okay, so <laughs> I have to say this. Since last week, we talked about doctors giving their patients orgasms to cure hysteria. I felt the need to go out and find some more sexual facts. And I think that every episode, we're going to put a sexual fact. Thank you. That is what I told Brian on the car ride home. I said, they're loving it. And I was like, I think at the end, we need to put some kind of sexual content, nothing, because, you know, I'm sure children will find this or whatever, but it won't be vulgar. It'll be funny. So this week's sexual topic is Cleopatra. And she was the inventor of the vibrator and was said to pleasure herself with the vibrations created from a box full of angry bees. (laughs) What if, like, there was a hole in the box? Then what would she do? Yeah, that's what I said. You know, what happens if one of those bees, those angry, like, pissed off bees gets out? I mean, you got a whole other slew of problems at that point. I mean... Was she humping the box? I, I, no clue. Was she humping it or just sitting on it? No clue. But if I ever, when I die and if I get to meet her, I'm going to ask. That's inquired minds want to know. Okay. That reverts back to when we talked about the labels on things. Did she just come amongst a box of bees and say, hmm, I'm tired. I think I'll sit on this box. Oh, wait, it's vibrating. What is that, bees? Oh, wow, that feels good. I'm going to take that home with me. I mean, I don't know. I just, I think I'm more, like, I'm more curious as to how many times a bee escaped from that box (laughs) and stung her. And, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's where swollen pussy comes from. I don't know. I just, I'm curious. Like, you know, that that's for all of our perverted listeners out there. You know, if you're perverted like me. And myself as well. Yeah. Holla at you. Because uh, <laughs> you guys rock. Yeah, well, a lot of people ride horses. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, I know guys, guys don't like to ride horses. Um, because, you know, they squish their, their junk. Um. I couldn't imagine having something in between my legs and having to move it out the way, you know, anytime I want to go and sit down on something. I mean, I can't, I can't lie. Like, I, you know, I've walked through the house and gotten like my boob caught on like the door frame and that like, that shit hurts. It does. And someone even said getting hit in the balls is worse than getting hit in the tit. I don't think so. It still fucking hurt. Yeah, it kind of does. I mean. Uh, yeah, uh, it it yes, it does. It hurts horribly. But I just wanted to give our listeners a little bit of you know sexual like history fact in in this podcast because it was such a hit with last episode. Well, I will definitely um, Google Cleopatra and I will veer in that direction and see uh, where she went with that. That's interesting. I like that. I have to give it up to our girl Cleopatra for. In- Binning the vibrator, props to you, girl. And uh, I'm going to dedicate this episode to her and her box of angry bees. As always, friends, we're wishing you unpleasant dreams. I'm Lindsay. And I'm Amanda. And we'll catch you next time when we discuss the LaLaurie Mansion in New Orleans, Louisiana on Blood and Black Lace.